Welcome to video 9. Um, you can see here back in 05, uh, 19th of the 2nd, 05, um, I started with a, an attempt to understand to replicate Floyd Sweet's VTA. Um, this came partly through frustration, partly through um, anger of knowing uh, too, too well that history had been hijacked. Our history has been hijacked. We've been lied to um, and it's, to be honest, it's not getting any better anytime soon. There's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not even thousands and thousands of machines that have produced excess energy. Um, the volume of data uh, is so overwhelming that for anyone that has done the re research, done the proper research, it, it's evident that we've been lied to, that this information has been withheld. Um, the human race, again, has been hijacked. Your history has been stolen from you. Um, so I decided to try and do it as public as I possibly could to get in and learn as much as I possibly could, as quickly as I possibly could, to try and get up to speed. Knowing that some of these people that were showing experiments that um, were fantastic according to our super science that we had at the time, uh, knowing that some of these people were highly educated, some of these people had educations that not just a, a, a few weeks at, or even a few months at a, a course somewhere could sort of teach anyone. Uh, mathematics wasn't my strong point, um, electronics wasn't my strong point, um, many many things wasn't my strong point. I actually come out of a a panel beating apprenticeship um, not too far before this. So I was fresh um, as a hands-on, dirty, sweaty panel beater. So I decided I'm going to do this for myself. I'm going to make an effort. I'm going to do it as public as I possibly could and I'll learn as much as I possibly could, as quickly as I possibly could to try and make a difference. To try and show people out there that yes, little things can can make a difference. One person, um, if, if they have enough support from others, can make a difference. Um, and it took me many, many years working mostly by myself. Um, I had a few friends that, you know, from sort of time to time would sort of join in and help, in, help out a little bit and stuff like that. But most of the time it was by myself. Most of the time I was doing all this, you know, by myself, on the bench, um, little experiments here, little experiments there. Um, and my life fortune was spent doing this. Um, I sort of look back on it and I, to be honest, I don't regret it. Uh, I think at the end of the day, I think the most amazing thing is uh, what we've achieved over this time was actually the goal that was set out. Now Floyd Sweet was a genius. Um, anybody that, that has at least the slightest little piece of um, research into Floyd Sweet will know that he was very highly trained. He, he knew a lot more than what most engineers, magnetic engineers, would know. Uh, now I've tried to validate some of his credentials that have been shown. I've not been able to validate them, um, which is probably quite obvious to most people. Depends on the reason, obviously, for the um, validation. Um, but obviously, at some stage, he was trained somewhere. So I spent years and years and years trying to replicate uh, Floyd Sweet's VTA, trying to understand the VTA, trying to understand Floyd Sweet, trying to understand the circles of people that he um, associated with. Um, and so on and so forth. It took me a long, long, long time. Um, and again, I spent a lot of money doing this. Um, 
and to be honest I look back on it now and just about all the money I spent was a waste and when I say a waste a waste because the money that I did spend didn't make a single bit of progress almost till the end now when I was close to the end of um, this particular project um, when I was close to the end I had made some simple um, experiments that had proved that there were a lot of lies told Floyd Sweet never conditioned magnets for anyone that still believes that honestly you're in the wrong place Floyd Sweet he did play with the magnets because he was trying to learn about the magnets but he never conditioned the magnets the, con the magnets themselves were never um, beaten around into any sort of shape um, there was never any modulating magnetic field that was produced by the magnets themselves um, there was never any of that. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite is true. In some of the experiments that I did, you can actually prove that the magnets had a, an extremely good, very high quality magnetic field in them. Uh, and I have proved in some of the experiments um, in these pages. So what I'm sort of trying to say, and the reason I sort of started with this in this video, is that people need to realize the absolute most simple things first and I've tried to, to hammer it into people, I've tried to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it it is a changing current will produce a voltage an applied voltage will allow for a changing current electromagnetic induction is one way electrical energy can be created. Lenz law does not mean that you cannot get more energy out than what you put in. Lenz law is um, is a it's a utility that if Lenz law is understood first of all and second of all used properly Lens law can be applied in such a fashion that it can actually be used to produce extra energy. Lens law is an assistive force if it is used right, and people have said that before in the past. I'm not the first person. So I think it's important. I think this is important. Now I look back on some of my old work and I think to myself, oh god, what an amateur. Um, but that's great. I learn a lot. You know, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of, you know, ex experiment, there was a lot of learning, there was a lot of, you know, playing around. Um, you can see there I scavenged a whole lot of capacitors out of the old ATX power supplies and sort of put them all together as a bit of a capacitor bank. Um, yeah, that was great. I learned a lot about capacitors and, you know, how by paralleling or series capacitors they made a difference to the overall uh, voltage rating and also the capacity that they would allow for. So starting off it was um, <clears throat> it was daunting. Um, I sort of threw myself on the deep end and I vowed that I'd never give up even though I sort of from time to time I come close I vowed that I'd never give up. I thought to myself right well no one else is going to do this we we need to if I want it done I'm gonna have to do it myself. Um, and sure enough, um, how many years later? Uh, 30th of the 11th, 2014. So nearly five years ago now, it's actually nearly five years ago, almost to the day, but not quite. Um, I come out and I was sort of showing um, coils that were opposing each other. The magnetic fields of each coil that would oppose each other. Uh, I had made some discoveries that um, did not lead me to the Floyd Sweet VTA um, as the Floyd Sweet VTA is an offshoot, if you like, of, of this technology. This technology here is, is how Floyd Sweet got his VTA to work and that is undoubtedly correct. 
um, but the, the VTA there was a little bit more to it. Um, so just to let you know that I finished this um, or finished off the replication project because I felt that there was no more that I could provide um, uh, and, and also I didn't want to um, go any further with what I had already learned uh, for quite a few reasons and I don't really want to go into that but anyway um, so you can see here if you were to go through and sort of read through that I'd made sort of several discoveries um, that um, you know the right hand grip rule for example will give you a bit of an idea on where the magnetic field's going if you apply a current in a certain direction uh, I'd spent a lot of time learning about Lenz law electromagnetic induction um, a whole bunch of different things um, I tried to do it as cheaply as possible but I think by the time I was about here I think I'd spent about 200 grand roughly um, so it was a lot of money a lot of money anyway we sort of got to the point where not long after this I thought right well it's probably time to um, make a bit more of an effort to get people involved because right here right at this date I thought to myself if it was just me and if I just posted you know something pretty fantastic and then all of a sudden I was to disappear then all the work over the last you know 10 years would sort of be in vain so I went to one of the forums started sort of you know, getting to know some of the people there and, and sort of moving through the forum and trying to sh sort of share a little bit more. Most most of the people sort of knew of my work, you know, from the website. Anyway, we sort of got to the point where at that stage we were studying some of Akula's work, um, Akula0083. Um, is he Russian or Bulgarian? I can't remember now. I think he might have been Russian, but anyway. Um, Anyway, some of his work was was also very um, helpful in, in the work that I was doing at the same time. Uh, for the simple reason is, is some of it appeared to be, from the outside, along the same lines, along the same um, method, if you like. Um, there were some things that he was talking about that I'd already talked about, and so on and so forth. Uh, I didn't know him. I, I'd not had any communications with him, at least not as far as I was aware. Um, so I didn't know him at, at that stage, um, and I have never met him as far as I'm aware. So unless he's contacted me and been, um, you know, anonymous or something like that. So I had a pretty good sort of idea on what was going on. Some of these videos here, uh, that one there, there's a, a lot of good information in there. Um, but some of these, you know, updates do have a, a lot of good information. But it was about probably maybe about here that I think the the path started to change. Actually, it might have been a bit before. Uh, and what I mean by that is I I felt strongly that sharing the way that I was sharing wasn't a good way to go any further. I, I sort of thought to myself, we need to get more people involved. We need to get people doing this for themselves. We need to get people doing little experiments. You know, we need to get people thinking about what's it going to take to get a voltage and a current out of the end of this coil. And really, at the end of the day, there's three things that you need, and that's all you need to, to light a small light, is you need a coil, you need a magnet, and you need to move either the magnet or the coil. That's the three things you need. It's all you need. And the, the simple thing is, um, basically, you, 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 all you really need to think about is a changing current produces a voltage, and an applied voltage will allow for a current to change. Um, so that's electromagnetic induction, and it really is as simple as that. Now, energy really it's already there it's already in the coil it's all the charge that's in the coil uh, it's every electron it's every ion or hole if you like um, any charge that's in the coil the copper coil and remember the, the very definition of the term conductor so that the conductor will carry a current 
the very definition of the term conductor means that charge can flow through it. So we need to sort of break break this all down to the absolute most smallest, simplest, logical pieces of information and start applying it much more simple. It's been way over complicated. Uh, some of it is complicated, but some of it's been way over complicated. And we've been lied to for too long. Um, I mean, realistically, for, for $20 and an hour's work, if the person on the bench knew what they were doing, they, they could build themselves a small en energy machine. Um, I mean, a cooler did it. He's he shown hundreds of videos. You know, a small machine, probably under $20. I mean, he salvaged a lot of his parts, probably didn't even cost him $20, you know, an hour's work. And here he was, he was showing, you know, people running in energy machines. It would be lighting LEDs, you know, continuously, sometimes for hours at a time. There's no way that a capacitor, you know, of, of 10 and 100 UF could light, you know, some of these LEDs as long as they could. There was energy coming from somewhere, and the energy was being pumped. Okay, the energy that was powering the load was being pumped out of the coil. And to pump energy, you've got to put it under pressure. It's, it's as simple as that. It, it honestly is. So a pressure is two opposing magnetic fields. Again, simple. It's a pressure. It's a pump. Any pump must create a difference in pressure. So to pump anything, whether it be liquid or anything like that, you've got to have a difference in pressure from one point to another and to pump you've got to put the pressure in behind what you're pumping whether it be liquid or whatever to pump it to where you want it to go and that pump is electromagnetic fields two of them opposing they have to be two opposing and the two that are opposing cannot be your input and that's how, it's as simple as that, that's how you get rid of the whole um, problem of conservation of energy. Conservation of energy is only viable, only, only uh, true, and you know, I mean this has been pointed out quite a few times in the past, it's only true in a closed system where the system will not allow a, a an extra source of energy to come into the system. Um, now all you need for a source of energy, as we said before, is a changing magnetic field in the proximity of a conductor. So when a conductor sees a change in magnetic field, you know, a steady static magnetic field does nothing. But a change in magnetic field, which is a change in current, by the way, then you see a change in voltage. So pretty much the pump can be set up so that the magnetic fields, once they're brought under a, a certain condition, the magnetic fields, because we have three of them, and remember that three is not symmetrical, you can't get symmetrical out of three if you have two output coils opposing two output coils and those two output coils are opposing each other then one of those output coils must assist the primary there's no other way it can work it's an asymmetrical system so it's it's really really simple it's it's so straightforward that it's just not funny once once it's been broken down to the smallest possible pieces. What I mean by pieces is if you were to look at the Tom Beard and Meg along with um, the other guys as well, Steve Kenny and all them, um, if you were to take the Meg itself, even just the name, motionless, implying that there's no um, rotation of a rotor okay so motionless implying no rotation okay so if, if we have a generator the generator must have a shaft and the generator must have a rotor and must have a stator 
Okay, so typically you would think of the uh, the shaft turning the rotor, the rotor having magnets on it, the magnets, the magnetic field actually cutting the coils, um, the coils then producing a voltage. A changing magnetic field produces a voltage. So electromagnetic um, generator. So motionless electromagnetic generator. So what they're implying here, just by the very name itself, implies that the magnetic flux in the core is being made to move to cut the coils to produce energy. So it's a motionless electromagnetic generator. There's no shaft and there's no rotor. This is just the stator. So it, it's it's implying just in the name alone that the um, processes here being described are still exactly the same as a generator. They've just figured out a way to have no rotor, no stator. The magnetic fields are the interactions of the magnetic fields in the machine itself. Any machine with at least two magnetic fields, two is the minimum, two is normally symmetrical. So, if, so let's say for example, which is not true, but let's say that this coil over here was our primary coil and we were to drive our primary coil over here, creating a magnetic field over here, this coil over here would be a secondary coil, this would be the load that would be um, in inductive obviously, visually to this coil over here. As the current changes in this coil here, the voltage over here would change and because it's loaded then a current would flow then this coil over here is electromagnetically inductive compared to this coil over here so electromagnetic induction it is exactly the same in a generator and a transformer there is no difference it's the same process as is just a different way of doing it so the, the changing flux of this coil over here, which could be represented as the shaft turning the rotor with the magnets on it. That's all it's representing. Now we know that this coil over here and this coil over here are independent input coils, and these coils over here, this one here and this one here, are output coils. We know that. We already, we already know from all our research. So what we've managed to do is we've managed to take the mag uh, remove the shaft, remove the rotor and still generate electromagnetic energy. It's, it's an electromagnetic generator and it's motionless. Now this is something I just wanted to show everyone. This is something that's been up for a while. Um, so one build up produced a hundred times more power out than, than was input. Okay so it's it's not hard it's just the way that people think about it people need to erase the the lies that they've been told people need to erase the the falsities people need to start thinking for themselves thinking outside the box saying i am only going to let myself be limited by what i choose not by what someone else says Okay, I mean this is this is just one of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of devices throughout history. I mean, uh, Lester Hendershot, you know, um, T. Henry Moray, you know, I mean the list goes on and on and on. Um, got to think outside the box. You got to think changing magnetic field. You got to think, you know, load. You got to think, think, well, you know, what what's going to happen if it's symmetrical? What's going to happen if it's asymmetrical? We've already shown all of this. You know, video 6, a symmetrical machine. Video 7, we went asymmetrical and look what happened. Almost instantly, without doing any real work, it was only a few minutes on the bench, and we got a successful result. And what's more, the result was in line with what Andre Malenkenko told us some 10 years before, or even more. It was... It was about 2004 or something like that, um, and also which which um, Terry Al has also said in some of his early interviews. 
So we've got to think outside the box. Don't let yourself be limited by something that someone out there that we don't even know who it was threw their hands up in the air and said, no, nah, can't be done. Can't be done. Absolutely. 100% can't be done. And that's it. This is a law. Okay, well, I'm here to tell you it can be done. I'm here to tell you that we've shown experiments that give you not just a foot in the door, and give you a pretty much the exact way to do it. I'm here to tell you that there's other machines that work on the same principles. I'm here to tell you that those other machines have also sh shown the same results, if not similar to very, very much the same. Um, it, it's, not, it's not rocket science. Okay, you've got to think simple, you've got to break it down, you've got to make it simple. Um, and that's sort of where I was at. I sort of made these early discoveries over here, um, you know, through some of this, opposing magnetic fields. Look, this over here is opposing one way, this is opposing the other way. Um, you know, over in this post over here, we talked about some, um, some of the Russian parametric oscillators and all that sort of thing. I learned a lot when we were doing that. Um, over here, you know, like measuring the weight of a mock-up VTA with the same sort of turns and stuff like that, you know, that that was pretty interesting to find. Um, we also checked things like um, shim stocks or razor blades. Um, there's a lot you can prove just by replicating something and even if it doesn't work, there's still a lot you can prove. Um, so anyway, I mean, even down here, I was investigating um, opposing magnetic fields. You know, the, there's a, a ton. Uh, I think I got a bit sidetracked over here for a little while. Some of the Viali stuff, and that's why I warn people as well. By the way, I warn people: don't get sidetracked. Don't listen to to what um, what people on the forums will tell you because that's why they tell you sometimes some of the stuff is complete rubbish not not Richard Vialli some of the some of his stuff did work um, but it sidetracks you and that's the that's the reason they do it so they try and get you sidetracked so that you lose momentum in what you're doing you, when you do something you've got to stick with it and you've got to get it going um, I mean over here we we knew that there were some lies told the magnet conditioning process described by Tom Bearden what was not true but I don't know how Tom Bearden got that story. I don't believe I don't believe off the top of my head that Tom Bearden made that story up. I believe that Floyd Sweet may have told Tom Bearden that story and gave him information to try and throw him a little bit off track. But I I have a funny feeling that Tom Bearden may have known that magnet conditioning was false. So I've done a few projects. Um, some of the ferro resonance they talked talked about ferro resonance with a cooler and stuff like that around the 2014 mark. Uh, Floyd Sweet was about 2005. Um, HHO um, about 2007. The Meg was about 2009. Um, so there's some pretty cool stuff there. Uh, some of my research. Um, a free energy device that's Paul Raymond Jensen um, there's tons of stuff on my website go and have a, a bit of a read if you want to hydraulic ram pump um, funnily enough when I was a kid uh, I don't know maybe you know 11 or something like that or even even earlier perhaps about 7 um, my dad and I we sort of mucked around a little bit with the hydraulic ram pump and I thought that was fantastic I just couldn't believe that some something was sitting there and the you know, energy was coming from the, the gravitational force on the water flowing downhill uh, and this machine was running from you know essentially from nothing there was nothing plugged in it was the energy of the water that was making this machine run and it was, it was a resonant machine it, it, it basically ran at a frequency that um, was resonant to the way the system was built you could get it to run faster or slower depending on different things that you did to the machine to to um, to change it um, so that was a fantastic little little um, exercise I was very lucky in my life I guess to to actually experiment with those things at such a young age perhaps a great deal of influence on me 
Lens Law, Lester Hendershot. Um, I really like Lester Hendershot. I think he was he was a giant. He never stood a chance, even though he had connections in some of the highest places that I've um, researched. Um, you know, I mean, if effectively, he was building machines for the U.S. military um, back in the in the twenties. Uh, now I'm sorry to say, but you know, a man building machines for the U.S. military back in the twenties, and we still haven't got these machines out in public. Anyone with half a brain in their head can see straight through that and say, "Oh yeah, we've been lied to." Yep. Um, magnetic modulation of charged particles. This is what we are doing, my friends. We are modulating the charged particles inside the copper wire with magnetic fields. We're modulating, um, putting them under pressure. We're pumping them. Remember Floyd Sweet. The original name for the Floyd Sweet generator was the Space Quanta Modulator. Um, Nonlinear inductance. This is some of the Andre Melanchenko stuff. I didn't actually click to that until a little bit after I'd actually already put all this up. Um, so I'm not even sure if I've even given them um, credit on some of that stuff. I do apologize. I should have. Um, some of the Borderlands, the early Borderlands stuff. I mean, that was done pretty early. It was, it was 2013, but I'm pretty sure that that was an experiment that I'd put up at that stage that I'd done a lot, lot earlier on. So I'd sort of shared the information from a lot earlier. Um, anyway, look, I don't want to sort of bring the history up too much, but I think people need to know the history for the very simple reason is otherwise they're going to repeat my history. And I don't want people to repeat my history. What I want is I want people to learn from my history if that's what they choose. I want people to save their money if that's what they choose. I want people to um, experiment and replicate what I've shared if that's what they choose. Uh, I want humanity to catch up the hundred years plus that we've lost. That's what I want. I want humanity to be what humanity is supposed to be like JFK said, free and independent. It, it really makes me mad that that so many people have been oppressed for for so long. You know, we are effectively slaves to a we're a slave race, and I I don't know who to, but we are slaves. We've been lied to. It's just not fair. Enough's enough. It's time for people to either do this for themselves or be happy continuing on being a slave and I'm not I'm not I want things to change so this is why I put so much effort in this is why I try and encourage people to to do what they um, you know what they want to do um, you know we don't get a lot of views on our videos I wish we got more views I wish we got more interest I wish we saw more replications on our website um, come and visit us be part of something better our website is it, it's unique this is one of the most unique websites you're ever going to find on the internet um, there's no one else out there like us we've shared more information we've given more information to humanity than any other website out there on the internet about what we are doing about helping people to become free and independent if that's what you want, then this is the stand that we all need to make together. Okay? It, it can't be done. Well, not by one person. It's got to be done by everybody. Again, light up the darkness because that's what we need to do. The darkness is shrouding humanity. We need to light it up. Education is the path forward. Um, so, look, please come join our experiments. Chris's non-inductive coil experiment is where you'll find this series of videos specifically. Um, we've gone through lots and lots and lots of different experiments. There's lots of threads on the forum that are very important, um, but this is where this particular series of videos um, is located. If you have any questions, please ask. We've got a, a lot of um, very knowledgeable members 
fantastic bunch of people so I want to put a big shout out thanks to them um, come join us um, and and try and let's all move forward together on this you know, because it is so important you know if you have kids you'll understand that you don't want your kids to to live as a slave we, we you know we don't want our our future we don't want our kids our grandkids their grandkids you know to live as slaves it's time we we broke the chains and and moved on it's time we become the race that we are supposed to be it's time to stand up stand tall and not let ourselves be oppressed anymore okay so just to reiterate just a little bit this is some of the progress from video 7 uh, again we have our asymmetrical transformer okay this is our DC pulsed input in the background um, that MOSFET there is switching at 3 kilohertz with a 10% duty cycle 10% on 90% off okay so this coil over here one this coil over here two this coil down here three okay the top coil and this bottom coil down here oppose each other and we have a magnetic uh, interaction between the two coils the diodes here separate these interactions between the coils okay so when the input is turned on okay, our 10 percent duty cycle starts these two coils in a bit of a fight for each other um, the fight if we time it right and if we um, get it into the optimum point this fight here is resonant so the magnetic field from this coil and the magnetic field from the bottom coil down here are exactly equal and exactly opposite at the same time and our input effectively sees no load all right that is the secret our input will effectively see no load and in fact to be perfectly honest sometimes power can come back through your input to actually charge or try and power the source okay so be aware of that because it can happen and does happen in some situations okay so when these two coils here are in a resonant situation this coil here opposes the bottom coil over here and if it's in a situation where it's equal and opposite at the same time the exact same magnetic fields the exact same everything um, then the magnetic field interactions between these coils is only excited by the input over here just remembering it's the change in current that produces the voltage okay all right uh, now I just want to be perfectly clear at this stage what I'm showing here is just a it's just the start this is one small experiment in a much bigger scheme all right so please understand that what I'm showing here is one small experiment in a much bigger scheme this can be done lots of different ways what you're seeing here is not the only way okay it, it, it's just the start it's giving you something to aim for it's giving you um, a machine that you can look for the effects for it's giving you it's giving you a foot in the door where no foot in the door existed before all right so just remember that because it is important okay so again just a close-up okay you've got to remember the asymmetrical transformer that's the critical part um, and when I say asymmetrical people might say oh what do you mean what do you mean well asymmetrical means where you don't have one magnetic field being the input completely opposed by the secondary which would be the output okay that's symmetrical what you have is you have an input that's not opposed directly at least anyway by your output okay so it's asymmetrical what you're using is you're using three magnetic fields to counterbalance each other so the equation would be 1 plus negative 1 plus 1 equals 1 whereas for a symmetrical transformer it would be 1 plus negative 1 equals 0 so you're left with nothing nothing excess there's no excess at the end of the day um, and when, when I'm saying 1 1 is the magnetic field 1 is 
um, one is the magnetic field from each coil so the primary coil here will be one okay the secondary coil up here might be negative one which is back the opposite way and then the tertiary coil which may be um, again this is completely up to you how you define the coils um, but you sort of get the idea the tertiary coil would be plus one again so plus one would assist the primary okay so it's in a forward direction with the primary and the secondary would oppose the primary so if you have one opposing the primary and one assisting the primary then one plus negative one cancels out so there's no load on the primary Alright, just a close up of the diodes again the measurement resistors these are just um, metal strip through hole 0 0.1 ohm resistors good old O1 oscilloscope Okay, another bit of a close up alright just a few messy horrible scope, shot, scope shots um, now the numbers I'm not going to deba debate the numbers you, you can see some of the numbers here and you can get a bit of an idea but really what I'm trying to show is I'm trying to show the asymmetrical regaging all right asymmetrical regaging is really important um, I hope hope this sort of makes a bit more sense Tom Baird is showing it for a long 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 time now we've seen it in many other devices um, it, it's it's a pretty critical aspect to get these machines to work if you don't have the asymmetrical regauge period then you can't have um, the work period that follows so asymmetrical regauging means that we've got say for example 10% on time and then 90% off time so that means that the machine is doing work 90% of the time okay and the input is only on 10% of the time the input is the time when the machine is regauged and that's when the when the coils are brought back up to potential again Okay, this is the regauge period so we can see here uh, I've got to apologize just quickly because in the video I actually marked from here to here as the uh, regauge period but it's actually from here so that there is 10% in the overall uh, duty cycle um, you can see there's a fair bit of ringing and stuff going on in here but that's normal that's just how it works it's part of the whole thing now the ringing can be used so that you hear and understand what I'm trying to say here the ringing can be used to actually find frequency that could be more advantageous okay so look at the ringing and think about what the ringing is doing okay just another close-up again the 10% on time you can see between the spikes so from this one here to this one here it's 10% on and then the rest from here to over to here is 90% off okay so from on here we've brought our coils up to potential okay and then we're leading letting our coils drop down the potential okay so off time over here the machine when the input is off the machine still outputs energy to the load all right it outputs energy to the load in between here and here as well so for 10% um, on time we're still getting energy out to the load um, but again because the partnered output coils oppose each other um, there should be minimal load um, on the primary coil now, you've got to think about that it's something that I've had a few questions before in the past some people said oh well you 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 know you, you've always got the primary being opposed well the primary is only being opposed if it's symmetry if if you have um, say for example if you had um, Iron Man and um, what was his name again Iron Patriot and they're both you know aiming their um, their um, hand pieces their hand weapons towards each other yeah and then at the end of the day there's going to be a, a great big huge um, opposition isn't there in the, and we've seen this before and I'll just show that hang on just a sec alright so here you go here remember I am the original EM junkie um, this was a response to Maglovin um, and down here here it is Iron Man Iron Patriot okay what we're doing is we're aiming two different forces of equal um, magnitude a bit opposite direction 
toward each other. So, I mean, this is a pretty scientific sort of thing. If, if you study this, you will see it throughout nature everywhere. Um, the sources themselves, here and here, um, if you aim something at the middle, it, it will tend to, um, you know, collect in the middle. At least to a certain degree, there might be reverberations or something, which you do see later on. Um, or I should say shock waves. Anyway, the point of this is... Um, Look, look at the actions and the interactions. Okay, if you were to sort of go through um, and have your 10% opposition from here to here, and you have two coils oppose each other, two primary, uh, sorry, two secondary coils oppose each other, then the net force, the net force on the primary, will be very low to even zero. Depends on the um, coupling of the coils. If you adjust the coupling of the coils, you um, you might be able to change the situation. So you've got to think about a few things, you know, to make that make sure that happens that way. Um, okay, again, this is the bit with the light. Okay, so this is the load on the secondary second coil. Um, okay, so again, 10% on time in here. Okay, we brought our potential down to to zero. Um, up here, a potential still up at uh, channel 1, red channel, 200 millivolts per division, so we're nearly 400 millivolts just here, um, and that's current. Okay, so we're 400 millivolts just, just to the load, just on that coil. Um, so, I think, I think it's pretty important to sort of say... Um, you know, we're getting the same, you know, decay over time here. Um, you know, we've got an on time here where obviously the on time is, we're seeing it. We can see the effect of the, uh, of the on time on one coil um, being slightly different from the other coil. Okay, we saw m m perhaps a little bit more of a ramp up on the other coil, whereas this one here, we're seeing it being brought down much quicker. Um, so these are the little things that you might need to sort of just keep an eye on, you know, just, again, as this is a successful experiment, it's, it's just that, you know, it could be done a lot better. Uh, a little bit more of a look in at the switch in, okay, this is, uh, again, you know, we're, we're seeing a pretty sharp, steep drop off here. Just a bit of a different shot. A little bit more inf information on the other traces. Um, and again, this is the output current. No, it's, sorry, it's not. This is the output voltage is yellow. And output current, the red. Um, so, yeah, it's, I mean, the total output here, 700 milliamperes. Uh, and because the voltage spikes were too high, we weren't getting a very good mean reading, so it was 17.57 volts on average. Um, so again, this is just a, a rough scope shot of what was going on. Change just a little bit there. Um, just so that you know as well, I, I try to, I don't always, but I try to have a look at the mean and have a look at the cyclic RMS. Sometimes you'll see a huge difference, sometimes you'll see a very small difference. If you're wondering what that is, we've done a couple of videos on it and done a on a few threads um, on our website on the high sorry on the um, aboveunity.com website. Um, so jump in, have a bit of a look. Um, cyclic RMS, you will measure the um, energy going forward and the energy coming back. Okay, mean is normally the mean energy that is traveling in one direction okay so mean would not mean doesn't give you um, a net energy moving one way plus the energy moving the other way net mean will give you the net either moving forward the gross or the I should say the gross energy moving forward as a total or the gross energy moving back as a total and if it's moving back it'll come through as a negative so it'll be negative 703, um, but it's not, it's moving forward, so it's a positive gross um, current of 703 uh, moving forward. 
remembering this circuit on um, the current the itself um, actually had a, a diode in there um, so I'm not sure to be honest I'm not sure how, why there's so much maybe it's because there's information that's off the scope anyway all right so I think that's probably enough of that um, that sort of goes through that's video 7 uh, if you were to have a look at video 7 again there's some pretty good results in there considering uh, 12 volts input was just over 400 milliampers I believe was the input uh, again I'm not going to debate numbers it's not what I'm here for um, you either um, take this and start doing a little bit of research on it or you don't really at the end of the day I, it doesn't worry me for those people that do want to do it more than happy to help for those people that don't want to do it I'm not twisting your arm and I've got no intention to okay so this is either can be used or not used it's up to you I'm not here to debate debate numbers I'm not here to debate how it works I'm not here to debate anything like that I just want to help people so um, for everybody out there um, I think this is probably long enough we've got a 40 minute video or something for everybody out there if this video has helped you I'd like to ask if you can afford a small donation that would be awesome it takes a lot of time to get these videos together um, it takes a lot of time to show everybody the work that I've been doing um, I'd very much appreciate it so a great um, big thank you to everybody um, come visit us be part of something better